better growth changes the future. Thank you very much for your attention. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. في البداية بشكر أستاذتي الغالية الأستاذة الدكتورة سناء يوسف على دعوتي للمؤتمر وبشكر اللجنة المنظمة للمؤتمر الأستاذة الدكتورة مي نصار الأستاذة الدكتور إيهاب خيري والأستاذة الدكتورة ياسمين جمال ربنا يكتمل لهم الشفاء إن شاء الله وبشكر الأستاذة الدكتورة نيفين على البرزنتيشن اللي ما استحقش كتير فيه الأستاذة الدكتورة سناء اختارت لي موضوع صعب شوية ذا كيدني as a cause of faltering growth. <laughs> uh, my talk will involve three points. The definition, nutrient deficiency in various renal disorders, and the conclusion. First, the definition. Uh, I found a dilemma when starting this talk to see is it a problem of weight only or weight and height what's meant by faltering growth. So I refer to my uh, dear uh, sister, Professor May Nassar, and ask her, is it a problem of short, short stature will be included under uh, faltering growth or not? She told me not. It's mainly concerned with weight. So I, I, I uh, revised also the Sheffield children by definition Weight faltering describes the weight pattern, not a diagnosis, and it presents a spectrum from what may simply be a normal variant to children with serious problems. And a weight that crosses more than two centile spaces is often the recommended threshold concern. And the causes tend to be multifactorial and often involve problems with diet and feeding behavior that usually respond to simple target uh, advice. Then I found the American Society of Pre uh, Parenteral and Enteral Nutrition which described the pediatric malnutrition as an imbalance between nutrient requirement and intake and resulting in cumulative deficits of energy, protein, or micronutrients that may negatively affect growth, development, and other relevant outcomes. So I stick to her advice uh, because Short stature is another problem with kidney uh, diseases. And I stick to the weight problems. And according to this definition, I stick to the nutritional part of these weight problems. The renal disorder simply can be classified into glomerular or tubular. And the glomerular function is filtration. So I might get a decrease in filtration, that's glom decreased glomerular filtration rate, the chronic kidney disease or an abnormal filtration with loss of proteins, that's nephrotic syndrome. The tubular function is reabsorption and uh, secretion, and defect in this will result in the tubular disorders. Food, as we know, is composed of these components, water, energy, carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, electrolytes, vitamins, and trace elements. We'll see what changes will occur in different renal disorders. So as I told you, I stick to the nutrition deficiency and nutrient deficiency in renal disease. And we can say that this nutrient deficiency might result from a decreased intake just in case of polydipsia. Polydipsia, secondary to polyuria, that occurs in several renal disorders, will uh, comp compulse the patient to drink a huge amount of water so that there is no space in his stomach to get any nutri nutrition more. Anorexia is another problem, and restrictions that we make in the diet of the, uh, the patients might also cause these nutrient deficiencies. The other aspect is decreased absorption, and the kidney is involved in absorption of two important uh, substances, the calcium and the iron. The, the last nutrient uh, deficiency mechanism is increased loss, and this might be glomerular or tubular, as we'll see in details. We start by the decreased intake, and we start by polydipsia. That's polyuria. What are the causes of polyuria? Causes of polyuria might be glomerular or tubular or urinary tract. The glomerular causes occur in the recovery from acute kidney injury, CKD, chronic kidney disease, polyuric phase, 
sickle cell nephropathy, diabetic nephropathy, and hypercalcemia. The tubular disorders that cause polyuria are many, many. Nephronophthesis, Fanconi syndrome with its causes, cystinosis, fructose intolerance, tyrosinemia, Wilson, Lewy, glycogenosis, uh, dent disease, mitochondrial, galactosemia, oxalosis. We have also the RTA, renal tubular acidosis, Barter and Gittelman syndrome, nephrogenic diabetes, insipidus, and toxicity from drugs or substances. Lastly, the urinary tract causes are the lower urinary tract obstruction with subsequent affection of tubular function and polyuria. All these conditions with the severe polyuria the patients have will be reflected on polydipsia with excess water intake and deficient nutrition. Anorexia may, is caused by, uh, in chronic kidney disease patients, the underlying renal disease itself, protein calorie malnutrition, metabolic acidosis, disorders of water electrolytes, and bone, metabolic bone disease, anemia, alteration of the gonadotrophic and somatotrophic axes, and the steroidal treatment in some cases. What causes decreased food intake in CKD patients? In general, these are due to anorexia, psychosocial causes, economic, cultural, or elimination, as we'll see. What are the causes of anorexia in patients with CKD? The uremia itself causes decreased appetite, depression, intercurrent illnesses, oral health problems, medications, hormones and cytokines, disruption of the daily routine in hemodialysis patients with nausea and vomiting during the sessions, abdominal fullness in peritoneal dialysis patients with glucose absorption in those patients. In our unit, in Ain Shams University, we uh, searched for depression among our patients. As you can see, we have found depression in about 70, 71% of our patients. We studied oral health problems, and we found many oral health problems. With correction of these problems, appetite might improve partially, of course. And we found decreased appetite or poor appetite in more than 73% of our dialysis patients. We have the orexigenic and anorexigenic hormones that affect the appetite and the changes in these hormones occurring due to the CKD or the dialysis session. We have for orexigenic the ghrelin and neuropeptide Y and anorexigenic on the top of the list is the leptin, the insulin, and etc. And we studied in our unit the neuropeptide Y and the leptin among the conservative, that's patients not on dialysis and patients on hemodialysis, pre and post dialysis. And we found a rise in these hormones, neuropeptide and leptin, although they have contradictory actions, both are high in CKD patients and both increase after the hemodialysis session. So we have the, uh, the cumulative effect of all these hormones that play in the decision which will cause the uh, effect to increase or decrease the appetite. What about the restrictions we do in our patients? Uh, I refer here to the Kedoki guidelines for the nutrition pediatric patients in, on uh, CKD, published in 2009. Uh, the evaluation of growth and nutrition status should be routinely done on a periodic basis, and the, the rate of these uh, uh, visits or this evaluation should be the double, at least the double, of what's done in normal, healthy children. And the parameters include both nutritional and growth parameters. Uh, and we have uh, patients with other problems, that polyuria, evidence of gross delay, decreasing body mass index, comorbidities should have more frequent evaluation. Body composition, serum albumin, prealbumin, transferrin are tools used to evaluate this. What about the nutritional counseling should be based and individualized? Also the nutritional intervention and frequent evaluation and modification should be done. This should be done coordinated by a dietitian and ideally an expert in the pediatric and renal nutrition, which usually we don't have. What about the energy requirements? The energy should be given 100% of recommended with supplementations. If the oral intake is not sufficient, the normal diet is not sufficient, we give supplements. And the oral intake is preferred, but if not sufficient, we might uh, resort to tube feeding. 
We can give intradialytic parenteral nutrition in severe cases. During the dialysis session, we give intra, uh, intravenous nutrition. And the calories from carbohydrates and fat should be balanced and the weight control if the patient is overweight. We have a problem of eating during the dialysis session. In adults, it's not recommended, but in pediatrics, we have to do it because the patients get an increased appetite during the dialysis session and we have to give him feeding. It's a good chance to give him uh, excess feeding. What about the carbohydrates? There is no guidelines regarding the carbohydrates, no recommendations, and the fats. But they recommend giving omega-3 fatty acids in our dialysis patients. The protein requirement, contrary to what's recommended in adults. In adults, they recommend to decrease the protein intake. This is not recommended in pediatric to maintain growth. So patients with CKD stages 3, 2 to 3, are given up to 140% of recommended, decreasing to 120% in stages 4 and 5, and decreasing to 100% in those on dialysis, where protein supplements may be needed if the normal diet is not sufficient. The fluids and electrolytes are dependent on what's the condition of the patient. If the patient is polyuric, excess fluid is given. If he is oliguric, we uh, uh, usually restrict the fluid intake. Also for the sodium in cases of hypertension. The potassium is usually limited unless there is potassium loss in this patient. The vitamins, the recommended allowance is uh, recommended also in CKD patients in, in different stages uh, as a diet. But for supplementation, it can be given if deficient in patients with CKD stages 2 to 5. But in dialysis patients, we only recommend to receive water-soluble vitamins and not the fat-soluble ones. And this is a study in our unit showing that dialysis patients had the lowest levels of vitamin E and vitamin C. The calcium, the phosphorus, and the vitamin D is another uh, issue that needs a, a special talk. But in general, the target uh, for our patients for concerning the calcium, the phosphorus, is the normal. It's not increased or decreased. And the vitamin D, we recommend to use both the uh, native vitamin D and the one, uh, the alpha calcidol uh, activated, one alpha activated form in patients particularly with hyperparathyroidism. Now for the decreased absorption, the role of the uh, kidney in absorption, uh, absorbing uh, calcium and iron. Here you can see that the transcellular absorption of calcium from the GIT is dependent on cal binding D. And this uh, uh, transmitter or, or uh, uh, substance, calvandine protein, is uh, dependent on the 125 dihydroxy vitamin D, which the kidney plays an important role in its production. For the iron, the kidney is functioning in both the erythropoietin dependent stages and the iron dependent stages. In the erythropoietin, we all know that all patients are, uh, with CKD uh, late stages are receiving erythropoietin uh, supplementation. But for the iron, it was discovered that there is a substance called hepcidin. The hepcidin is a substance that blocks the ferroportin, which is responsible for uh, passage of iron from intracellular to extracellular and to bind to transferrin. This hepcidin was found to be elevated in all stages of CKD, as shown in this study in our unit, particularly in patients with late stages of CKD. So this is the role of the kidney in absorption. What about the losses? The glomerular and tubular losses, of course, in the glomerular, they have the proteins that can pass, and the congenital nephrotic syndrome is an example for this condition. And here we can see the management of infants with primary congenital nephrotic syndrome, nutritional recommendation. It's recommended to have hypercaloric diet, protein supplements up to four grams per kilo per day, lipid supplements, A, D, and E, and water-soluble vitamins, calcium, magnesium supplements, and nasogastric or gastrostomy even may be needed to give these uh, supplementations or this uh, nutrition. 
as recommended, which is usually very difficult, and we get poor growth several, uh, uh, frequently in those patients with congenital nephrotic syndrome. For the tubular, these are the substances that are supposed to be reabsorbed by the tubules, regardless of the different conditions, of course. The water, bicarbonate, glucose, phosphorus, low molecular weight proteins, amino acids, organic acids, potassium, sodium, calcium, chloride, and magnesium. I like you to imagine what's the condition of the patient if he has more one or more of these substances lost in urine. To take example only water, water is filtered from the uh, kidneys. Uh, an amount filtered per day is 180 liters per day. And the absorption is 99.8% of this amount. If this is defective, you can imagine what will happen to our patients. So in conclusion, the kidney should be put in the list of causes of faltering growth. Renal causes include a wide spectrum of diseases that can be broadly classified into glomerular and tubular. Chronic kidney disease is a special entity that requires close monitoring as it involves many aspects. The management of all renal causes of faltering growth is dependent on the cooperation between the nephrologist, nutrition specialist, and dietitian to deliver the necessary information to the patients and their caregivers in a practical, applicable way. Still, this cooperation is not, did not reach the standard required, and this greatly affects our patients' well-being. I hope this will improve in the near future. Thank you.